All right, good morning. I thought what we would do this morning is we would go over any problems that you have and review what we did last week. Uh, then, if we still have time, and I suspect we will, uh, I'd like to go through with you uh, a max-min problem. That's, I guess, kind of a challenge problem, but some of you might be interested in solving it. I don't know if anybody has attempted to solve it before, but it was one of those challenge problems in the textbook. So I, I need to go back before we talk about vertical asymptotes from a calculus angle. I need to go back to math 20, not 20, math 30-1 and talk about non-permissible values. When you have a rational function, all a rational function is is a function that is, well, the definition is it's a polynomial function divided by a polynomial function. Uh, I, I like, I don't really care for that definition because According to that definition, if a rational function is a polynomial over a polynomial, and I don't, I don't understand why this has always been defined this way, and it always is. Um, maybe I'm mistaken about the meaning of a rational function. A constant is a polynomial function. Like the number 2 is a polynomial function. So according to this definition of a rational function, a rational function is, an example of one would be x squared plus x plus 1 over 2. And I don't consider that a rational function. I, I guess maybe, maybe my mistake is it's technically a rational function. But I consider rational functions to be functions where you have a polynomial over a polynomial, but the denominator is not degree 0. In other words, it has to contain x's in the denominator. To me, that's a rational function. And again, maybe, maybe I'm mistaken, and something like a quadratic function is a rational function, technically. But uh, we certainly don't treat it like one. Anyway. <coughs> When you have a rational function, you're going to have non-permissible values. If you go with my definition, which is not what you would find in a textbook, the denominator must contain x. It has to contain the independent variable in the denominator. And that means that, I might have just misspoken slightly a minute ago, you have the potential for non-permissible values. I might have said you're going to have non-permissible values. But if you had a denominator like x squared plus 1, which is definitely going to give you a rational function, there's no non-permissible values because the denominator cannot equal 0. x squared plus 1 will never be 0. So, however, just to make things interesting, if we consider that rational function, x squared plus 2x plus 1 over x squared minus 1, the denominator can be factored into x plus 1, x minus 1. And since it can be factored into x plus 1, x minus 1, you're going to have non-permissible values of 1 and negative 1. Um, so what I'm doing right now is reviewing math 30-1, and I'm just scanning the room. There's at least one person in here who's in 30-1 right now and has not been taught this officially. When you factor that rational function, express the entire function in factored form, the numerator factors into x plus 1, x plus 1. The denominator factors into x plus 1, x minus 1. And the point I'm making here is that if you have a factor of the denominator that contains an x and has a 0, there's a non-permissible value. Just to begin with, what that means is x is not allowed to be 1 and x is not allowed to be negative 1, which I think is pretty obvious looking at the denominator, right? And, and I would hope many of us probably wouldn't even need to factor it to see that. But since the x plus 1's cancel, well, since the x plus 1 in the denominator cancels, these two non-permissible values, and it's still Monday, so my brain is still firing up, I guess. I should say not equal to, to be very specific here. These non-permissible values, 
reveal themselves in two different ways on the graph. This will be a hole and this will be a vertical asymptote. Got it backwards, don't I? The one that cancels will be a hole. So the x plus 1 has the non-permissible value of negative 1. The one that cancels will be a hole, and the one that doesn't cancel will be a vertical asymptote. How many of you remember that rule from Math 30-1? Hopefully, very complicated rule. It's just something you have to remember. And you know, in Math 30-1 and also in calculus, we don't get into why that's the case. I suppose we could, and I'm just using this opportunity to talk about limits, talk about x approaching negative 1 of the function and talk about the limit as x approaches positive 1 of the function. And what you would discover is that when x approaches negative 1 of the function, the limit will be 0. It will have an actual value. And this is nothing new. If you were to put 0 in here, and I would like you to put 0 in here for x in the original function. Uh, sorry, put negative 1 in here. Go ahead and put negative 1 in for x and see what you get. Pardon, what will you get? No, you won't, actually. You won't get 0 when you put negative 1 into the function. I'm talking here about this function, putting negative 1 in for x. Mackay? Right, you get that 0 over 0, which takes us back to maybe day five. And when you get zero over zero, that means it's probably likely that you can change the argument of that limit to accommodate the substitution in this case of negative one. And if you do this, you're left with this, and this is how we evaluate limits, right? And when you put negative one in, you end up with negative one plus one, which is zero over negative one minus one, which is negative two. You end up with zero over negative two, which is zero. Which tells you, think about this, that as x is approaching negative 1, y is approaching 0. But since 0 is not a permissible value, there must be a hole there that y is approaching. Um, on the other hand, if you were to evaluate this limit, you would discover it's undefined. And this is where we kind of took a different path on Friday. Undefined can mean positive or negative infinity. And if you have a limit at, that you're approaching some value of x and it's approaching infinity, that's an asymptote. So the last point I make here is that if you want to determine the behavior of the graph near the vertical asymptote, you have to look at the limit as x approaches a from the left and from the right to find out whether the graph is pointing up or pointing down, pointing to positive infinity or negative infinity on either side. Does that make sense to you? We're okay with that. Um, can you take a look then at your work? Does anybody have any questions here you would like me to go over? No? Farhan. 3G? D. So we would like to, and, and we're going to have to do a bit of work here. We have to sketch a graph, which means really you have to use everything that we've learned about
analyzing a function for graphical purposes up to this point, and that includes intercepts, asymptotes, and max mins or first derivative tests. Um, I will point out to everybody here that sometimes using calculus to graph three on the top. Sometimes using calculus to graph something like 3 over x minus 6 is overkill. And for that reason, I'm not going to worry here about doing a first derivative chart. I'm going to approach it from a slightly different angle. We might do a first derivative chart. We'll see. So the first thing to note here, Farhan, is that we have a non-permissible value of 6. And that means x cannot be equal to 6. The second thing to note here is that this non-permissible value is in a factor in the denominator which doesn't cancel completely with an identical factor in the numerator, which means it's a vertical asymptote. It's not a hole. And I don't know if, there, if any of these actually have holes, but I wanted to include that in my review. So we have a vertical asymptote. at x equals 6. Now, here's where it gets a little tricky as a teacher to, to explain this because I haven't taught you how to find horizontal asymptotes yet. That's what we're going to be learning today. But what I will do is I will go back to math 30-1 and remind you that if you have a rational function with a degree on the top that's smaller than the degree on the bottom, then what that tells you is that you're going to have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. That's just the rule. There's a reason for that, and we'll get to that reason today. But this will have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. And that at least gives us an idea of what we can start to sketch here. We're going to have a horizontal asymptote on the x-axis, and we're going to have a vertical asymptote at x equals 6. So what the graph will look like in terms of the bare bones is we are going to have the x-axis being a horizontal asymptote, and we will have over here at x equals 6 the vertical asymptote. So in order for you to decide on the behavior of the graph near that vertical asymptote, and again, I'm kind of just sidestepping the issue of the horizontal asymptote for the time being, you need to take the limit as x approaches 6 from the left of the function, and you need to also evaluate the limit as x approaches 6 from the right of that function. So the function is 3 over x minus 6 squared. Now again, I, I talked about this on Friday, but I think it's an important thing and it bears repeating. You already know there's a vertical asymptote at x equals 6. So what that tells you is that these two limits must be infinite in value. Whether it's positive infinity or negative infinity, that's the way vertical asymptotes go. Y takes off upwards or downward. So what it amounts to here, and this is a unique situation, but what it amounts to is for the left-hand limit, putting in a number like 5.999 and exploring whether we get positive or negative. I hope everybody sees that when you put in a number really, really, really close to 6, that number minus 6 will be very small. It will be negative, but it will be very small. And I, I know it's Monday, and my brain's still firing up, and yours is as well, I imagine, but really think about this. If the closer I get to 6 the difference between that number and 6 gets even smaller, then the denominator of this is going to approach 0. 
And that's where the infinity comes from because you're going to take 3, a non-zero number, and divide by an infinitely small number. Um, Farhan, when I put in a number very close to 6 from the left, in brackets, I'm going to have a negative tiny, 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 tiny number. But when I square it, it's going to become a positive tiny, tiny, tiny number, which means that the entire thing will become positive and it will be infinite. And you can use the same argument for the right-hand limit. It's just that for the right-hand limit, if you want a specific number, and you don't have to use a specific number, you can just say will it be positive or negative, and then it will be infinite on top of that. But if you put in 6.0001, a number really close to 6 from the right, you see that you get positive. Now, all that's telling us, everybody, is that the graph is asymptotic upwards against that vertical asymptote. We could find a y-intercept. The y-intercept would be 3 over 0 minus 6 quantity squared. That's how we find a y-intercept. We let x equal 0. So you're going to get 3 over 36, which is 1 over 12, which is a very tiny number. Um, when you couple that with the idea that the horizontal asymptote is at the x-axis, this graph, so now I'm going to commit to more of a detailed shape. This graph is going to come down, and it's going to cross the y-axis very, very close to the x-axis at whatever 1 over 12 is. We could use the fact, and uh, this is good because I get a chance to review some other things here, that this is an even function. Uh, you know what, I shouldn't say it's an even function. That this function is going to have a symmetry across the line x equals 6. It's not an even function because it's not symmetrical across the x-axis. But if you imagine, and we can go back to math 30-1, that we talked about this function, this is even. Because when you put negative x in, and you square it, you get the same function that you started off with. All the function is in your textbook in this question that we're asked to graph is that function shifted 6 to the right. So it still has a type of symmetry across that vertical asymptote, which means that we can draw the same shape here. Now, we're, we're basically done. Uh, this afternoon, I'll talk more about the fact that what's happening with the horizontal asymptote is as you approach negative infinity, the graph will approach that asymptote. Or as you approach positive infinity, the graph will approach that asymptote. I don't think I want to do a first derivative and a first derivative chart here. I shouldn't say that. I'm going to, and we won't do the challenge problem. You don't need to do a first derivative chart here, but let's look at what would happen if you did. Our function is y equals 3 over x minus 6 to the negative 2. Is that right? Okay. So what is the derivative? The derivative dy dx would be negative 6 times x minus 6 to the negative 3. If you want to be clinical about it, then you would say times the derivative of what's inside, which is 1. So what we end up with for a derivative is dy dx is equal to negative 6 over x minus 6 cubed. And that would mean that you would have to look from negative infinity to 6. What am I doing? You would have to go from negative infinity to 6 and from 6 to positive infinity. And then up here you would have negative 6 and you would also have x minus 6 cubed. And Farhan, I'm just going to ask you, because you initially asked me about this a couple of weeks ago. Are you okay with me putting those two things beside each other even though we're dividing? Okay. Um, what would we populate this with? This would be negative. Um, this would be negative and then positive, which would mean that y, well, we'll do dy dx first. 
is positive, the derivative is positive, and then negative, which means the function is increasing, then decreasing. But, and actually, now that I think of it, I think Evan had pointed out that there are certain things you don't actually need to do. Uh, I, I think that was you in the example we did last week, where after we were done it all, and I put up top all those arrows showing whether the function was going up or down, Evan pointed out, did we really need to even do the first derivative looking at the asymptotes? And the answer was no. But we can confirm here that the function is increasing everywhere up to this point, and then it's decreasing everywhere after. Does that make sense, Farhan? Okay. Any other quick questions that anybody has? Okay, so I suspect that what will happen this afternoon is we'll just go over any final questions that you have, and then we're going to get into um, horizontal asymptotes. We still have a lot of work to do here in terms of graphing, and most of the functions we're going to be graphing will not be as simple as this. They will be more complicated. Okay. Uh, so when the bell rings, have a good rest of the day, and we will see you all later.